Hello, everyone. Good evening. So please be sure to check our website for the full schedule. Thanks to those of you joining us virtually and here on 8th Street. A reminder to us in person to please silence all cell phones. We will reserve time at the end for a Q&A with the audience. For those in the room, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so our online audience can hear your question. For our Zoom audience, please submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Following the lecture, please join me and our guests downstairs in the clay room for light refreshments. The New York Studio School is grateful to the following funders for their support of the 2023-24 Evening Lecture Series. The National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Robert Lehman Foundation, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, and many generous individual contributors. Please consider making a donation to help keep our evening lecture series free by clicking on the support button on our homepage. Relatedly, we would love to see you at our annual benefit on Thursday, October 19. $150 tickets are available for the cocktail reception and silent auction from 6 to 8 p.m. And some dinner tickets are still available as well. Please visit our website to learn more. Now I'm delighted to introduce our speaker this evening. Jessie Mochran received her BA from Bernard College in New York and her MFA from the Night Gallery in Los Angeles and Natalie Card Gallery in New York and Gallery Periton in Seoul. Her work was most recently featured in the 16th Leon Biennial of Contemporary Art and she has been included in group exhibitions at the Dallas Museum of Art, the Bunker in West Palm Beach, Spurs Gallery in Beijing and Almeinrec in Brussels among others. Her work is in the permanent collections of numerous institutions, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Dallas Museum of Art, LACMA, MOCA, Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, and the Rubel Collection in Miami, as well as in institutions in China, Germany, and the Netherlands. Macron lives and works in Philadelphia, and her spectacular exhibition, The Venus Effect, is currently on view at James Cohen in Tribeca through October 21st. Now please join me in offering a very warm welcome to Jesse. Thank you so much. Mm, technical difficulties. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You just sign it over. It's usually how it. It's just my notes aren't there. There you go. Up to left. <laughs> we tried this before and it worked. So I'm not sure why it's not now. Okay. It's just not giving me the notes. There it is. You did it. Thank you. 
<laughs> Yay, thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks for bearing with me. Thank you all for coming. So I titled this talk Reframing Art History because reframing is both literally and figuratively a core concept of my practice. Literally, I am cropping and extracting and repainting details from past paintings. And figuratively, I am re-examining re historical European works in our present context, looking at how meaning and gender codes transform over time and across culture. So I decided to try something a little different with this talk. Typically, I would start with like when I finished my MFA program and go forward from there. Uh, but tonight, we're going to try going backwards in time. It's an experiment. Somewhere I read that looking at art, looking at an artist's work from newest to oldest is more edifying. So we're going to see if that's true. I chose just a painting or two from each year to talk about. And I'm starting with the, this work, which is currently on view at my show at James Cohan. Uh, through October 21st. This work is titled Reputed Fair. Um, oh no. Mm. Okay, sorry guys, one more second. All right, so the show is titled The Venus Effect and the whole ex exhibition centers around historical representations of women with mirrors, ranging from scenes of the toilette to biblical and mythological stories. This painting is a closely cropped extract from A Girl with a Mirror by Paulus Moore Else from 1627. So in this work, there are multiple symbols of vanity and sexuality. You have the mirror, which is meant to represent her vanity. You have the jewels as well. And then this inset painting, which is a symbol of sexuality. In the original work, the figure, you see the full figure and she has a breast exposed. It's just like popping out of her top. and the moral tale of the original was a condemning of the sexuality of this attractive young woman. But of course, the painter made her attractive to seduce the viewer because painting has to make you want to look at it. So when I'm appropriating from historical work, I'm interested in the impossibility of viewing these old works without bringing my current cultural interpretation shaped by the times we live in. Um, I'm not an art historian, even though I majored in art history and visual arts at Barnard like 20 years ago. So when I'm looking at these art historical works, I am doing so really visually as an artist. One of the things that I found really compelling about this work in particular was this inset painting um, in the original, which I reproduced here. And it's the story of Hermaphroditus and Salamassus. So I had never heard this story before coming across this painting. Salamassus was a nymph who was obsessed with Hermaphroditus, who was this young, sexy guy. So she pursues him into, like she's chasing him, he keeps rebuffing her. And one day when he's bathing, she goes after him and throws herself around him and prays to the gods that they be united together forever. So the gods turn them into one being that is both male and female. But her name disappears from history. Uh, I had never heard it before, and I don't think it's very familiar. So I thought it was an interesting story to highlight um, from a feminist point of view. Here's an installation view of the work in the show. Seriality plays a large role in my practice. Since I'm working from existing imagery, a lot of the work is really about combining things. It's almost like a curator creating meaning through combination and juxtaposition. I try to keep the figure essentially the same size throughout the exhibition so that you could kind of imagine the figures moving from frame to frame. Keeping the sizes of the canvases the same also helps with that which was advice I got from my advisor when I was in grad school at UCSD. When the sizes of the canvases are consistent, you just give the viewer one less thing that they have to mentally adjust to. Which doesn't mean that I keep the sizes of the works the same. I actually like playing with scale a lot, like this wall of the show that has the smallest works in the show as well as one of the larger ones. 
For me, the size of the canvas is determined by the amount of the body in the composition. So a cropped painting that's showing only a face or a hand or um, these two hands and the hair on the left is gonna be a small painting and a figure, when I wanna show the full figure, it's gonna be a larger work. The title, The Venus Effect, is a perceptual phenomenon named for the art historical tradition of images featuring Venus looking at herself in the mirror. So when you see a picture of Venus looking at herself, the viewer is fooled into believing she's looking at her own reflection, but in reality, her line of sight in the mirror connects with the viewer of the painting or with the painter who made the work. So that seemed like an apt metaphor for these historical paintings themselves that are supposedly about women's vanity or uncontrollable lust, but actually show a female subject gazing adoringly at the male painter who fashioned her. This, this painting is also a cropped section of a larger historical work. This one is called Exhibition from 2023. And it's a depiction of Lascivia by Abraham Janssens from the early 17th century. I included the original reference here so you can see it. Um, you can see that the image is reversed. I like when I'm painting to have the light coming from the left side, so I invert the works when I need to. So it says lascivia on her chest and her figure is meant to be like the embodiment of lust there are two birds copulating on her hand and on the left side there's the still life with the fruit and the wine and on the right there's this interesting little still life with a little bottle of liquid and a sponge which suggests bathing and to me knowing that sponges were employed as a barrier method for contraception I was wondering if it wasn't actually a reference to sex and contraception. So when I made my painting, I cropped in to focus on just her face in the mirror, the hands, the birds, and what I've decided is <laughs> a contraceptive device. I'm not certain that's true. But for me, a woman who may have been depicted as sinful or lust, sinfully lusty in the 1600s feels empowered to me in this moment. And I enjoy like how tilted this composition became and how kind of unsettled that makes the space of the work. I've also cropped out the nudity so like the breasts are not visible. Uh, the Venus effect as a show overall is also much more saturated than these original sources. Each painting has its own color palette, as if each figure is cast in their own colored light. And sometimes I've used a super cohesive color palette for a show where every painting felt like it was set at the same time of day. But in this show, I wanted them to feel like stills from different movies, different times of day. And then together, I thought it would have a beautiful effect. Since color is relative, everything feels consistent within the frame of the work. But when you see it next to another work, you can see, oh, this is like a very purple painting. Um, and this one, it feels sort of like moonlight or nighttime to me. I also made a new group of drawings to accompany the current show, which are titled Women Grieving. They're pretty small. The paper size is just 12 by nine inches and then the drawn area is four by six. So these are colored pencil and pencil on blue toned paper, which has a historical feel to it. I started making these kinds of drawings just in the past year. Before that, I was really only making preparatory sketches that would are just a normal part of my process before I started painting and make a quick pencil drawing. And I was also making oil paintings on paper, which feel almost exactly like the paintings. So I wanted another thing that I made that felt different. There are some artists that can do installation, sculpture, video. So far that has not been me. I am just trying to expand this little 2D world that I operate in. So the women grieving came to, as I was starting to conceptualize the Venus effect last year. It was shortly after the Dobbs decision came down overturning Roe v. Wade, and I was trying to plan this show, but all I kept drawing were women crying and women with swords. Mm. And I ended up pivoting to the show about mirrors, but I kept the crying women in the back of my mind and eventually decided they could serve as a counterpoint to the paintings in the show, representing a different facet of the female experience. And instead of their like these grand performative narratives that you see in the paintings, the drawings are about these private moments of mourning on an intimate scale. 
you can see there they were it doesn't look green but it was it's a very pretty green wall and um i feel like the smallness of them and the way they were lit really created this intimate atmosphere where you had to get close to them to see them um it felt to me interesting like they were almost crying alone like truly unobserved which is of course an impossible contradiction but an interesting one so we're leaving 2023 behind we're going to 2022 <laughs> this is my painting called for she died I came across this original reference at the same time I was drawing all the crying women. Uh, it's called The Birth of Benjamin and the Death of Rachel, and it's by Farini. And the painting resonated with me right away because I haven't seen very many paintings depicting women during childbirth. So I was already thinking about the risks of pregnancy and childbirth and what the, how they affect women. And then in this painting, there was this reminder of what birth looked like in a different century and how it's always been fraught. So in the, my research, I read an interesting article about this original painting that speculated that it was a reference to the new cesarean procedure because the stitching in the garment is over to the left-hand side, which is like the, where they would have made the cut for a C-section. And... Um, this is not like where you would have lacing in any kind of dress. So the location of it is so unusual that it perhaps was a reference to C-section. Um, and the story of this is Rachel, it's a biblical story and Rachel wants desperately to have her own baby. And when she finally conceives and gives birth to a son, she dies in childbirth. So my work depicts an extract of the original painting. It's cropped just to show her post-birth moments before her death with the many hands of her attendants reaching in to touch her and all those hands felt like a timely metaphor for the intervention of others into the private lives of women this is an in-process photo for any painters who are interested this painting is on a red ground i was trying a different acrylic ground by michael harding that is supposedly not absorbent but oil painting can be totally crazy making because oil tends to sink in and dry matte, which is most noticeable in dark colors. So then your dark areas are lighter than the light colors and it's very frustrating. So I don't like varnishing my paintings because I don't want them to be shiny. I like the paintings to be matte and powdery and visible. In my works, even the darker details from past paintings become really clear, like shining a light on the past. I want everything to be seen. I hate it when you can't see part of a painting in a museum because it's shiny and it's too tall and the light is reflecting off of it. So part of the painting process is like continually trying new grounds and new ways to prepare the surface to try to find something that will reliably and consistently behave. And you can see here I draw the composition in first with paint and I address the drawing as I go. So there are lots of different lines and I'll fill it in with the figures first using this black and white underpainting. And then I try to work on the foreground details first and then go backwards. This painting is from started in 2021, uh, finished in 2022. It's titled Transfiguration. And it was part of my solo exhibition, Reliquary at Night Gallery in Los Angeles in May, 2022. That show focused totally on historical depictions of St. Sebastian. And I've been making diptychs like this one since 2017. This painting has two different references that are made about 150 years apart. The faces of the two Sebastians are folding into the gap between the panels truncating the bodies and also creating a new one across the panels that's in transition between day and night, male and female, life and death. The painting was exciting to me because I was changing the setting of the originals to create this dappled light on the bodies. And then part of the process was purchasing this fabric and lighting it and buying like fake branches online and using them to, uh, outside to try to create the shadows and taking new photographs. So St. Sebastian was of interest to me at the time because of his association with plague and 
dealing with this coronavirus pandemic. And for me, like icons like St. Sebastian, whose cultural significance transforms over time with the meanings that people attach to him, is really interesting. So originally he was a Christian martyr, and then he was believed to be a savior from plague, and then he becomes a queer icon. So because he survived being shot full of arrows, he was considered a patron saint of healing. And he was referenced by artists during the AIDS epidemic as well. So all these contradictions in the figure of St. Sebastian were super interesting to me. The religious ecstasy, the suffering, the arousal, the masochism, the androgyny. I think a lot about the fragility and the resilience of the body and St. Sebastian with the arrows penetrating his flesh was a perfect metaphor for that. This is just a little painting on paper to show you an example of the kind of paintings on paper I was talking about. It's also made with oil paint. Um, and it's a good example of kind of a literal reframing where this is just a crop detail, but I felt like it was successful because you can still kind of feel the weight of the body and the penetration of the arrows, even without seeing the wounds. This painting is from 2020, it's called Fallen, and it's a diptych that references one original source, which was split across the two panels. The original reference was a small engraving of two nymphs carrying a, another struggling nymph to a satyr who's waiting with an erection. He's cropped out of the frame in this painting. And because I was working from an engraving, I had to flesh out the figures, the faces, the hairstyles were all like Frankenstein together from different sources. 2020 felt like an apocalyptic time. And I wanted to set these figures in a background that would be dark on the top to contrast with the light areas of their bodies and then light on the bottom to contrast with the areas of their bodies that are in shadow. It felt like a new development for me and I still like think fondly upon this painting because it was one of the first times I was really inventing the light and the setting of a work rather than copying it from an original reference. So this dark on top light on bottom configuration lent itself to like the smoke from a fire and these abductors became possibly her rescuers and the action in the painting is ambiguous just like the genders are i'm not interested in reobjectifying naked female bodies like historical paintings often do i am more i'm just more interested in a fluidity of gender rather than a rigid binary which is restrictive and feels inextricably linked to patriarchy and misogyny This is also 2020. This is one of the first paintings on paper that I made. Again, when I was trying to find something I could make other than oil paintings on canvas. So I've been slowly expanding my repertoire. This is a little diptych called Caress, which shows two different moments from two different Judith and Holofernes paintings. So on the left, she's holding her hair about to decapitate him. And on the right, she has his head in the bag. Um, and it appears like so tender, but it's in fact so gruesome, which I love. And when I started painting on paper is when I started experimenting more with color um, because it was lower stakes. So if a painting didn't work, I could throw it out. Whereas normally with paintings on canvas, I resolve them. I, I don't really have any that aren't finished. I just keep working at them until they're done. Um, and. The underpainting for the bodies is often like a bluish tone. And so I was like, well, maybe I can make a blue painting. This is an example of a preparatory sketch. Uh, I make these in my sketchbook before I make any of the paintings. So the beginning of the process is I look at books, I go to art libraries, I download and print pictures, and then I draw from them. I usually have like a jumping off point for my research, but then I might end up going in a different direction based on the images I come across and what stays with me. Like when I was planning that St. Sebastian show, I started off thinking I was gonna do a still life show and ended up pivoting. I always start with drawing these rectangles on the paper first. So like the act of framing the detail is really like the primary act in my work. I studied photography when I was in college, and I think my photo background just plays a big role in how I think about composition. 
So this was a sketch I made for the work that was shown in 2019 at Natalie Carr Gallery in New York. That show was titled The Marks of a Stranger, which is the same as this painting. This show was all based on depictions of Lucretia, which was a popular story to paint during the Renaissance in Europe. This is a historical story rather than a myth. So Lucretia was a noble woman who was raped by the prince. She demanded justice from her husband and her father and then committed suicide. Her death led to the overthrow of the king and the foundation of the first Roman Republic. So it's a story that was written many times, painted many times. Um, and in the story, she's almost like a footnote, just the catalyst to the more important historical event, which was the overthrowing of the Republic and the founding of a democratic Rome. So in making a whole show about Lucretia, I wanted to focus on her story and all the representations of her repeating over time. It was less a portrayal of this historical event and more a reflection on the cyclical nature of storytelling itself. That storytelling is biased and fragmented and constantly shifting. On the left, you have like the moment of the rape and on the right, the moment of the suicide from two different works that are combined here into one. The title comes from a line in the play by Andre Obey about the subject from 1931. Uh, Lucretia says to her husband, the marks of a stranger are in your bed. In the context of the show, I was thinking about the marks also as painting marks, as artist after artist tells the same narrative again, stranger after stranger getting further from any sort of emotional truth. The black background around the figures obscures the space and the original context of the work and creates this theatrical, almost diorama-like space. It's a very shallow space that they're in, maybe like three feet deep. Um, and I think a lot about like the construction of space in the work This is an installation view of my 2018 show, Syrinx, at Night Gallery in Los Angeles. This whole show employed black backgrounds, which worked as a unifying structure to three different subjects I combined in the exhibition. The show looked at abduction paintings, images depicting witches, and hunting imagery. Abduction paintings are images showing women being carried off to be raped from many different myths and historical narratives. These were often commissioned to celebrate royal marriages, believe, unbelievably enough. So by combining these three subjects, I was interested in talking about representations of desire, of violence to the body and female agency in art history and now. This is an example of one of the images of witches that I referenced in the show. Hans Balding Grun made a lot of drawings of witches in the 1500s when fear of witchcraft in Europe was rampant and predicated on the idea that magic was done by evil sexualized women who got their powers from worshiping the devil and eating babies, which seemed really misogynist. Um, these drawings often show powerful women together behaving in like frightening and unnatural ways. They're, in this image, it looks like they're brewing some sort of spell to control the weather. These images really appealed to me though because they felt so different from the induction paintings where the women were passive objects, often half clothed, being acted upon by men. In these witch images, the women are the actors so even if the originals portrayed them in a negative light, they have power in these images and they have agency. This is my painting that references that engraving. It's titled Remedy, also from 2018. So the figures are arranged in the same positions, but that fearful intensity is gone. In reality, the women who were persecuted as witches were probably healers and midwives who would take care of sick people, use herbs to treat illnesses, and try to help women control their reproduction. So I wanted to reframe these witches in a positive light. 
They are simply powerful women with agency over their own bodies. In my painting, the gendered body parts are cropped or hidden from view, continuing my interest in gender ambiguity. And without clothing, they feel like they could be from any time. The title remedy refers both to the possible potion they are making in the urn and also the act of reframing these original works from a contemporary feminist point of view. This painting is from 2017. It's titled In Mid Word. It's based on a Boucher painting of Hercules and Amphale on the left and an Ang painting, Roger freeing Angelica on the right. So this was one of my very first diptychs. When I crop an image, I think of it as serving two functions. One is flattening the space that the figure is in because the dimensional figure runs into the hard edge of the frame. And the other is a heightening of the violence to the figure, because I think of it almost like slicing the body along the edge of the frame. So I realized in 2017, I had these little drawings that I was making in my sketchbook. I photocopy them and cut them out. And by moving them around, I realized that two of my drawings lined up perfectly across panels to make a complete work. And I realized that when you put these two cropped images next to each other, it accentuates that edges, that edge more than I think was coming through in the single panel paintings that I had been making. The images always sort of line up, but don't, which I think encourages active viewing because you have to, tr you can view them both together and separately. I also like the idea that there was kind of like a wormhole between the two canvases that there was a kind of time travel happening between panels and there's also this white negative space that plays really nicely with this black negative space that's erasing the original context and then you can think of the figures as either like emerging in emerging from the space in the middle or descending into it so the original references for this work were made almost 100 years apart. In the original, Hercules and Amphale are embracing while he's clasping her breast. And Angelica is chained nude and totally boneless to a big rock, while Roger, who's clothed in full armor, comes to save her. So I liked how these arms combined into one super long arm, and the restraints on the right mimic the restraint on her flesh on the left. And this blue curtain that comes from the original became like an architectural structure that mimics that rock on the right hand side. I have the originals here so you can see. For me, it's just really exciting that somehow through the process of quotation, I can bring such distinct works together and transform them into a new work that still references these past stories, but also can create its own meaning. This painting is titled The Picnic, and it's from 2016. It was shown at my first solo exhibition at Natalie Karg here in New York, which was titled The Pleasures of the Dance. So we have finally made it back to a point in time where I was using contemporary source material as well as European art historical references in the making of shows. The primary source for this painting was a fashion ad of an androgynous man lying by the side of a pool. So the flowers on the jacket come from another contemporary fashion source. And then the flowers that make up the background come from a Bruegel painting from the 1600s. So when I was making this show, I was looking mostly at contemporary men's fashion and Rococo painting and the parallels between both and in their interest in gender ambiguity and the idea of embracing feminine decoration. In this painting, I was definitely playing with the construction of space thinking about the tension between illusion and flatness and the way the body is camouflaged into the background. My favorite detail in this painting is there's this diagonal fold that runs through it, um, almost as if the fabric is, has a sharp crease in it, which kind of creates this illusion of a teeny step back into space. 
It mirrors where the edge where the pool was in the original image. This is an installation view of the work in the show. It was my first New York solo show. So I had already been showing with Night Gallery in Los Angeles and Natalie saw my work at an art fair and contacted me for a studio visit, which led to that show. So the show was looking at fashion and Rococo work, but focused mostly on interior settings. This show is also from 2016 at Night, Ga but in, at Night Gallery. It was called The Progress of Love, and I was still looking at Rococo and fashion, but everything was in this very blue palette and focused mostly on exteriors. So I got really into the Rococo because the images were amazing and because it tends to be a maligned era in European art history. It's been traditionally dismissed as a weak phase between the Baroque and the neoclassical, which emphasize action, mythology, and these grand narratives with heroic men. The Rococo, by contrast, is really about pleasure, gender ambiguity. It's images like shepherds and shepherdesses putting flowers in each other's hair in a pastoral landscape. It's a very different vibe. And during the Rococo era, there were a couple of influential women that had a lot of power and commissioned a lot of the artwork. So I was interested in revisiting that time as a thinking about it as an era where there was more gender equality in the imagery. And the real inequality is how this era is considered feminine and therefore less important than other time periods in art history. So by combining these references to historical works and contemporary fashion, I was trying to bring the past and present together. There is gender, gender ambiguity in both sources, and I was looking at the external signs of gender and how they are coded through the fabrics and the hairstyles and the decoration. This painting is from 2015, and it was part of that Progress of Love show. It's based on a tiny little Fragonard painting called Les Curieux from the 18th century. It's at the Louvre. It's probably like four by six inches, and it's one of those tiny paintings that's surrounded by an ornate frame that's like twice its size. And this was the first painting on view when you walked into the show. For me, the way these figures are peeking through the curtain functioned as a metaphor for my way of looking at these images as if through the viewfinder of a camera. The fabric is expanding to cover the whole surface, which helps to highlight the constructed nature of the space. I want to highlight the artificiality of the image, even while creating these illusionistic bodies and images. I think of it kind of like fantasy, it's like a beautiful thing, but it's so powerful you have to deal with it very carefully. Like you always have to keep one toe grounded in the real world so you don't lose yourself. Speaking of fantasy, before I got interested in Rococo, I was looking at a lot of images of K-pop stars, as well as historical portraits of androgynous youths. So this was in 2014. I started watching K-pop videos when an art school friend told me I should. And a lot of the men in K-pop are made to look younger and more feminine or more androgynous. And I thought that the gender codes at work in these boy bands were super interesting and not that different from the way teen heartthrobs have been marketed in the US. I was thinking of stars like Justin Bieber or from my childhood or teens, Leonardo DiCaprio who were also like smoothed and feminized to have a kind of safe sex appeal, one that wouldn't scare the preteens, like somebody with a lot of chest hair and big muscles. So I was thinking about fame and fan culture and the romantic attachment between the fan and the image of the icon. I was also thinking about fan art and this idea that tracing the image will bring you closer to the object of your desire it's just a very romantic idea of painting, which I love, that painting is attempting a kind of magic. 
And it's easier for me to see now looking back that this idea of a relationship between fan and image mirrors my relationship with historical European painting. I am like a huge fan and I want to have a dialogue with these objects of my desire. But that love is coupled with critique because I can't help but view things from this moment in time and my particular point of view. So looking at K-pop and historical portraits led me to create this work, which was included in my first show at Night Gallery in 2014, titled Midnight Sun. Some of the paintings like this one were based on images of K-pop stars, and some of them were based on historical portraits. And I wanted them to blend with one another. So it wasn't clear which one was coming from which time period. I was really thinking about cropping and creating these unexpected compositions like photos that had slipped out of their frames. This black was a real pain to get right. Um, it was something I worked on a lot to get right technically. I wanted it to be brushstroke free so that it wasn't highlighted as surface but could recede as space. Um, My whole practice of appropriation actually just starts with this painting. When I was in graduate school, my advisor suggested I could maybe someday try appropriating from one of the reproductions that was always circulating in my studio. This was one of the images I had around, which I love this painting because of the androgyny, because the gender codes are so different from what they are now, and this expression on this boy's face, which is somehow both arrogant and vulnerable. When I was in graduate school is when I really turned from back from photography to painting. And when I got interested in oil painting, I got really interested in the history of oil paintings. And so I was trying to learn about technique. Since I went to Barnard, I didn't go to an art school with a foundations year. So I was kind of trying to teach myself from things I read or heard about from other professors. And looking at these references led me to really kind of become obsessed with them. But appropriating from them felt like it wouldn't be, it would be like breaking the rules somehow. Um, like you're not supposed to do that, I don't know. But after graduate school was a very freeing time because I didn't have to defend anything I was making. And also there was absolutely nobody coming to see anything I was making. So it's fine. So I did finally indulge myself and made a painting that appropriated from that one. And this was the resulting work. It's from 2013 and it's titled Abracadabra, which is the title comes from a K-pop song. But it's also the way I felt about this painting as if it somehow magically became its own work while still referencing the original Sargent portrait. The main breakthrough for me at this time was that I drew this freehand instead of using a grid to transfer the image, which is how I was making paintings in, in graduate school. That felt important to me because I was making an image from another artist's work. And that's a practice I continue now, so I still draw freehand. I worked on this painting very slowly for like six months, and I just kind of willed it into being. And with the different composition and the flat black background, it became more contemporary. And it's cropped and it to focus in on the signs of gender, the red lips and the bow and the hair and the jacket. Issues of gender overlap nicely with painting and the portrait because gender is about the performance of these external signifiers. And those signs signify different things over time and across cultures, which reveals just how arbitrary and constructed they actually are. And those interests in gender and are still like at the core of all of my work. Here's a view of the work installed in the 2013 show Made in Space at Night Gallery in Los Angeles, which was curated by Laura Owens and Peter Harkowick. So this show is how I got started exhibiting. Peter Harkowick and I went to graduate school together at UC San Diego. 
and the Hammer Museum put on their first Made in LA biennial. And Peter and Laura Owens decided that they would curate their own East Side biennial show to counter the Hammer Museum show. And Peter remembered something that I said in grad school in a critique once that I, I don't remember saying at all. But he looked me up and they came by to visit my studio and I was just making really weird little paintings. Um, but they were still game to put it in the show, which was amazing. And then I finished this work just in time for the show and I sent them a picture and was like, do you want this one? And they were, oh yeah, yeah, we want that one. <laughs> so it was just really like a lot of luck um, for things falling into place at the right time. This is what I was doing in 2012. Um, I finished graduate school in 2011 and I really didn't know what I should be making after grad school. I made some small paintings from my mom's slides, which are this archive that I've still been carrying around with me everywhere I go, but haven't ever figured out how to work with. I painted some meerkats. It was really all over the place. Uh, I even went so far as to build this bunch of huge canvases and prime them and sand them and plan a whole show that I had nowhere to exhibit. And then I scrapped it before I even started painting them. And I got a friend to take them, thankfully. Um, but I was just so lost. And what finally helped me was making really small paintings like these. And these were based off of drawings that I made from my imagination. They are small and fast. They're like four by six or five by seven. And they're black and white, so I didn't have to think about color. And the process was really informative because it just helped me identify some of my core interests. So cropping, androgyny, the flattening of the space, the truncation of the body, and the, the way cropping activates the space outside the frame, inviting you to imagine what else is happening in the scene that you can't see. At the same time I was making those little paintings, I did this craziness. So my studio was full of images, all these photocopies of historical European paintings. My mom's slides are everywhere. And then images of K-pop stars and slash art, and I don't know what. And so it wasn't clear to me why I was attracted to all of these images. So what I did was I made myself write about them. So I sat on the floor in my studio and wrote like something about each image and taped it to the back. And when I was done doing that, I had like these categories that emerged from that process. And putting it into language allowed me to decode myself in a way to myself and gave me better insight into what I really wanted to be painting. So it was a very useful exercise for me at this time. And I just happened to come across these folders because I just moved my studio from Los Angeles to Philadelphia. So I thought I would share them with you. What's funny looking at it is like how many of these subjects are still just a huge part of the work I make now. So that's, uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you for going on this journey. Thank you so much, Jesse. What a, a beautiful body of work. And I, I've, I've never seen a presentation that starts from most recent and goes back in time. And I think it works really well. Cool. I'm um, glad. Do we have any questions for Jesse? Yes. Hi. Hi, Jesse. Thanks for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, my question is around the way you paint a finger, which I noticed is very unique. Uh, and it seems like a constant across a practice over the years. So um, where does the inspiration came from? And also, was it a device or something with a deeper um, sense of meaning? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there's luckily one right here to look at. Yeah, when I, hands are always a big part of the work, even in those weird little paintings I was showing you before, like hands are a huge part of the images from the very beginning. I think they're, 
really interesting stand-ins for the body and how expressive they can be. Like, other than the face, there's really no other part of the body that's as expressive as the hands. So, and I like the idea of these hands kind of communicating gestures that we've lost access to. So when you go around the museum, I, for one, often don't know what these gestures are meant to mean. And so these ambiguous signs that are pointing at some kind of meaning, but that meaning is lost or we're lacking translation was something I was thinking about. And when I started drawing freehand, the fingers just started getting weird. Um, they're almost like these like rubbery tentacles. They're missing some knuckles. <laughs> and that's partly from looking at mannerism, which I love looking at Fragonard and Boucher, who always have this like curly little pinky that's sticking up in all the hands. Um, but it's also, uh, what happened? Oh no, my thesis show. <laughs> <laughs> that was only if uh, <laughs> I ran out of time. Um, so the fingers are, yeah. Um, but I think a lot about this tension between beauty and the grotesque. So everybody is like super smooth and artificial and the hands are the same way. So they're extremely elegant, but they're also, if you think about the reality of these hands, like very upsetting because you wouldn't be able to do anything with these hands. Uh, and so I think about things like plastic surgery, that line between like, uh, when you push things so far into the artificial that it becomes uncanny. Uh, so I feel like that's part of what's at work with the hands, with the skin. Uh, it's really about playing with this line between idealization and the grotesque. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I was also wondering, looking at your paintings, I see a lot of influence of photography, because I know you were a photographer before. So in the cropping and the placement of the images, also in the sort of tones and the reference to works that have already been made, which is sort of very photography. So do you feel your background as a photographer is very important? And who are some photographers who have sort of, other than painters, who have influenced you? That's a relevant question. Yeah. Yeah, I do feel like the photography is really important. I started painting in high school. I had a really cool public high school teacher who introduced us to oil painting. And then I started taking it in the summers uh, and after school. And I discovered photography when I was at Barnard and it was just like the coolest, newest thing to me, working in a dark room and looking at all this um, photographic work. I really liked Nan Golden and Cindy Sherman and Diane Arbus and gosh, so many people. Um, Philip Lorca de Corsia and Jeff Wall and um, yeah, I used to, I, when I went to UC San Diego, I applied with photography because I had been living in Honduras and I didn't have access to a studio. So I was really just making kind of like social, social documentary style photography. And I applied with that body of work and got to UCSD and immediately started painting. Uh, Amy Adler was my graduate advisor. I finally had a studio space and she taught our intro class and she told us that we had to start making work immediately, which was good advice. But for me, like social documentary photography, like I didn't know anybody in San Diego. So I started making paintings from my own photographs. And then I got really obsessed with painting. But because I entered grad school as a photography student, I then taught photography for the rest of the time I was there. And I've never taught or TA'd painting, which I think is funny. <laughs> Um, but so, yeah, I used to have all these photographers and all these slideshows that we would talk about. Um, but yeah, I do think it's really important. I think it's the way I think about constructing images, almost like it's the frame and then things are being inserted 
into it. Um, so when I like going through that journey, I think was really helpful to the way that I think about composition. Thank you. Any other questions? I have two different questions. Great. We'll start with uh, this one. Uh, can you speak a little bit more about how you decide on your inspiration? You mentioned you go to museums, to libraries, you find images, but like, how do you decide where you're gonna go? Uh, which stories, which century, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I am really kind of stuck between like 1500 and 1800. Like I don't usually go far past those in either direction. And that's just sort of what I'm attracted to. I mean, I think there's so much amazing art. I sometimes wonder like, oh, I'm gonna run out. Like I'm not gonna be able to keep this practice going forever. Uh, but there's really like kind of an endless amount because then you get, I get into a new artist and I'm like, oh, I've never really looked at Botticelli. Botticelli is amazing and here we go. Um, and so, yeah, it just sort of comes out of fandom and obsession. I don't know. I, I the, the drawing is really helpful because I'll make a lot of drawings and I'm not precious about it. So I can draw anything. I don't have to do anything with it afterwards. So I'll make a lot and then I go back through the notebook and I star the ones that I really want to make. Um, and when I have, say, a small group of those, I'm like, oh, OK, now I need more of this, you know? So St. Sebastian jumped out at me in this Dutch Golden Age still life book because of the composition. And then I was thinking about the subject and how well it relates to all of these other interests of mine. And then I was like, well, now I need to find more St. Sebastian paintings. And so it really is just uh, an intuitive process and following my eyes and then doing the research afterwards. Um, OK, here's a question on completely opposite spectrum. So your works are in galleries now and museums. It really feels like you made it as an artist. <laughs> I, I kind of like, can you speak about that a little bit? Like your feelings, like when did you or like, oh, this is my big break. Um, or, or do you even, do you feel like there's something else coming? You don't feel that way? I'm just kind of curious, um, you know, like how's it feel, I suppose? Yeah, uh, I think that Night Gallery show, that group show was really like that big break because it can be hard to, get someone to notice what you're doing um, if you're working in isolation and your peers are like so important and then they go on to do crazy things like Peter Harkowick now runs Harkowick Gallery which is in Los Angeles and New York and so you just never know what people are going to do um, that felt like my lucky break because based on that group show Night Gallery came and did a studio visit with me and then they offered me a show and then we've just been going together since 2014. Night Gallery is like, I think they started in 2010. So it's like a younger gallery. So we were able to kind of like come up together, which was a great feeling. Um, in terms of making it as an artist, I feel like it always feels tenuous. Like you're just kind of like, I don't know how much longer I've got. Uh, I gotta, <laughs> I'm just going to keep working and hope it works out um but yeah i mean it's it, it wasn't something i anticipated i never sort of believed that could happen and one of the best things about it is that when you are an artist and you meet other artists at the galleries you're like oh these people are everywhere they're like <laughs> people everywhere are doing this and so it feels so much more real and possible um yeah, I have kids, I have a husband, I have like um, responsibilities to a family. I, I, ha I was pregnant with my first kid at, my f at the opening of my very first show with Night Gallery. So I've also done that all at the same time. I don't know, being a woman is a lot. <laughs> Jesse, we have an online question. Um, 
They're wondering if you can speak a bit more about your materials from ground color to mixing paint. You're such a magical painter of light. How do you do it? <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Um, I keep trying new things. <laughs> the ground color is like something I'm constantly changing. Actually, the first five years or something, I was just using this dark indigo color. Uh, and so I was really working the paintings up backwards. So like the ground would be dark and then the flesh would work up from dark to light. Um, and then I started varying that to see what would happen. It was really the, uh, the pleasures of the dance show in 2016, which was like a really warm and red show. And I was like, this is really weird to put this on top of dark blue. And that led me to start varying it um in terms of mixing paints i i have sort of like a core group of pigments that i use like yellow ochre cadmium yellow light rose matter raw umber uh thalo blue and lead white which is really useful and also titanium white and those are mostly what i use um can mix a lot of things from that and then i'll add in like magenta or a different kind of blue when I need it. Um, yeah, I, I don't use a lot of medium. That I think is maybe not super typical. I don't, um, I will add a little bit of walnut oil or something if I need to, like especially if the whites are super stiff. But for the most part, I am using like tube consistency paint. And so everything is very I don't know, buffed. <laughs> and to piggyback on that question about light, you mentioned that you often ensure that the light source is coming from the left. And I wonder if you can talk about that choice. Yeah, I think I just started doing that. And then it felt like the natural way to do things. And so to do it, the, I think there's a lot of superstition in painting. And I think that... <laughs> Uh, I think that I just was like, well, if I tried to do it from the right, it would all fall apart. So I have to keep doing it from the left. Uh, but it's also comfortable to me. And like one of the nice things about getting to paint and not having to um, have a side job is that you do so much painting that it starts to become familiar. So with like a forehead or around the eyes, like I sort of have a sense of where the light will fall um, from having done it a lot of times. So um, yeah, painting is all about light and space and just varying those things. And I keep trying to investigate them in new ways to keep things interesting for myself and for people who are looking at the work. Well, thank you so much, Jesse. I'm conscious of time. Um, so please, everyone, um, give Jesse a round of applause. <laughs> and of course, if you have any questions, please join us um, down in the clay room for some light refreshments and we continue the conversation. And our evening lecture series will continue tomorrow evening with a talk by Arlene Kaiser on Buford Delaney. Thank you all for coming.